When and where did you learn responsibility? I believe for most of us as we participated in the confession of sin today where it talked about wishing to take back some things that have hurt us and or told lies, that we find ourselves getting, finding ourselves in the light of recognizing that we are all in one way or another have drunk out of water that has caused us to be irresponsible and to not always be truth tellers. I remember the part of that emergence for me as a young man was moving from my parents' discipline to the discipline of the high school principal who helped me to recognize despite the fact that I wasn't the party who was guilty of the crime, I was an accessory to the crime even though I was unaware of the fact that I was an accessory. If you know what I mean. When the principal presented me with a situation that I had been involved in, my natural reaction was somehow to serve as my own attorney and defend myself and to say, I was unaware of it. He said, but do you own this? Is this still in your possession? Stolen lunch tickets. Are they in your possession? I said, how did I know they were stolen? He said, if you have them in your possession, you are an accessory to the crime. Self-defense, not wanting to be responsible, working through uh, that whole situation has taught me in later situations that being responsible, as we hear in our first reading for today, is our ability to choose our response. This was true for Abraham. He had a response that he could make when the call of the Lord came upon his life. Choosing a response that was obedient to God proved to be a blessing to Abraham. Choosing to make the right decision. Choosing to tell the truth. Choosing to live in ways that are in accordance with God's direction for our life. There's a number of things that come together here in the Spirit Garage as our, one of our readings focus on fire, God's theophany, God's revelation, and secondly, a reading that deals with the Holy Spirit. This is our focus for this summertime because I believe these stories help us to be aware that God's Spirit is still at work in our life, that God's Spirit still speaks revelation to us and can guide and direct us, and that God can, in fact, use us to make a difference in this world. You may have noticed as we look at Spirit Garage 3 that we also have a subtitle, Being Forged by God for Mission. Last week we used coal as the metaphor for the heating up of the tools that a blacksmith uses to make that useful, that in order to be forged, one has to bring heat to the power. So I'm thankful to Pastor Park who had by his fireplace a fake little, shall I say, coal shovel. So if you see a real black coal shovel, I would like that for future use. But it's, it enables us as a tool to put the coal into the place where we can heat up the vessel so that we can be useful to God. Fire has one of those ways of purifying our life and being able to bring out of us the impurities of deceit and white lies, cheating, hiding and keeping secrets from God and from others, etc. Those ways of our sinful human nature that God wants to work out of our system. But secondly, God gives to us his spirit that even while we walk in this human flesh, God can take us with our weakness and our poor, our poor choice making and make a difference in the world in which we live if we are open to God. Responsibility. It's quite fascinating to me that as we listen to the story, it reaffirms for us one of those lenses by which we read scripture, which says it always begins with God. It all begins with God. In this story of Abraham, who now has been given his son, that son Isaac that he has been waiting for, that he and, and his wife Sarah had been promised so long ago, and in their patience God finally provided. Today we see Abraham and Isaac walking along, and all of a sudden, God or the angel of the Lord calls to Abraham and asks him to do something which I think is beyond our comprehension in our culture. And that is offering up his son as a sacrifice to God, as a burnt 
offering to God. This is part of human history, however, and it crosses many different cultures. This has been a part of a distant past and may in fact, unbeknownst to us, be a part of our Viking past or our Germanic past or out of our Roman past because it's certainly been a past in almost every culture as in a way of appeasing the gods. And so this story comes as a culmination of saying that this is the end of human sacrifice for the Jews. Now I have to believe there's more to the story that, than what's picked up because I have to believe that Abraham had some wrestling to do in this whole discussion of a willingness to offer up Isaac. How about you? I can't believe Isaac just, or Abraham was just so obedient. His first thought was, is that you, God? If you're calling me to offer up my son I've been waiting for for years, in my old age, I'm going to march off and offer my son up. That's not where my mind goes. How about yours? I have to believe there has to be some debate that's going on. You've got to be kidding me. I've been waiting for this son for so long. My wife will have my hide when I get home. You know, all those kinds of things. But the story doesn't include that aspect. It says rather at the end of the story that Fred read that because of Abraham's obedience, it says that Abraham would be a blessing to all other people because he obeyed the voice of God, as hard as this call is to comprehend. A second thing that we notice in the story, not only was Abraham responsible, but God was persistent. Did you notice the double use of Abraham's name when it came down to it, saying, Abraham, Abraham. You know, getting your attention. If you didn't hear me the first time, I'm going to call your name a second time. For those of you who are married or have been married, has your spouse ever had to call your name more than once to get your attention to something that needs to be done? Maybe you understand. If you've ever been a child, maybe your parent ever had to call your name more than once to get your attention. This is what's happening in the story. For those of you who are here last week and have a recall of the story from the Old Testament that we used, could you share it with me? What was the fire story we read? I see it's got lasting potential in your brain. It is the story of Moses in the burning bush. And the doublet of the call to Moses was true in that story as well. The voice that called out of the, out of the fire said, Moses, Moses, here it's God calling to Abraham, saying, Abraham, Abraham, and Abraham responds. It's also fascinating, and I think there's some great symbolism in it, in what's going to take place when Isaac says, where's the lamb for the sacrifice, as he's putting the wood for the burnt offering onto his son's back. Meanwhile, while a little Isaac, the, the child, is carrying the wood, the father just carries the knife for the kill, carries the fire for the burnt offering. This is prior to times of matches and big lighters. Uh, so he's carrying the torch, the burning fire with him as they march off. These are the elements that are going to be used in the story, just like the coal shovel is a reminder of God's forging work in our life, how God can make us pliable and bendable, can, can weld together those parts, those fragments of our life that are broken, can bring healing to us. And so finally, as we were listening to this Genesis 22 story, they marched off to a set of mountains, and I don't know if you caught it, it's called the Land of Moriah. Now it's thought later in biblical story, they, they connect up the Land of Moriah, interestingly enough, with the Mount Zion. In other words, where, where Solomon builds the temple is over the place where Abram makes his sacrifice where he brings his son Isaac for sacrifice. This is the mountain onto which Jesus is sacrificed. It's on that same hill where Calvary is. There's that metaphor of the commonality of sacrifice and God's obedience and power that lies within. So what do we take from this story? Well, first off, it begins with God's call, which God has done in each one of our lives. 
God has called us to a place of faith. But God has done that maybe through his word, maybe through a parent or parents, maybe through friends who have accompanied us, maybe through the sacrament of baptism. God's call is issued at different points in our life. Secondly, it required Abraham's response. You see, God isn't calling us to be an audience here. God is calling us to charge the field and to participate in, in this game of life, this ministry and mission that God is about in the world to make a difference in the places where we're planted, to make a difference in the vocations to which we've been called, to make a difference in the lives, if we're a teacher, of the students who we just sent off to another grade or on to graduation or as we rest ourselves and get ready for a new enrollment of students, that these are the people that God has placed before us to impact, to bring out the best in, to be a salt to them that brings out their savor and their gift and their ability, that challenges them to discover who they are. And in our family units, to be that light in our neighborhood, in our families, that remind people of God's call in their life too. Because you see, together, we are to be people who dare to believe that God has more to do in our world and this community. So we seek to bring about God's kingdom here on earth that Jesus prayed about in his Lord's Prayer. This is what's spoken about in our second reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There is one body, this one body of faith that we are a part of. No, my, this is not just talking about grace. This isn't just talking about Lutherans. This isn't talking just about Christians of one stripe or another. These are followers of God who are seen in this story as being one in Christ Jesus. We are one body. We find our unity in the story of Christ. But secondly, we are all or many members of it. We all have valued gifts. Amen? You have valued gifts. God's Holy Spirit resides within us. And that's why we spend this time in the Spirit Garage so God can hammer into us those kinds of understandings that say, you are important to me. You are called by me. If I need to call your name multiple times to say to you, Stanley, Stanley, or Mary, Mary, you are an important part of who I am in this world. You are part of my body. And your gifts are significant to me. Abraham was old, but he was not retired from God's plan. He may not have physically in the stories been able to have children. That tells you that he's elderly, but he's still within the scope of God. God has not lost sight of Abraham. He still has a purpose for him. We cannot, while we are still alive, say, I am retired from being a part of God's plan because his spirit lives within us. Now, what do we learn about this spirit today? Not only is it God's call, not only are we called to respond to it, but God's spirit reminds us that God has given us everything we need to accomplish his purpose. In this story, Isaac was wondering, where is God going to provide the lamb for the sacrifice? And they said this familiar phrase, God will provide, right? In the ancient Hebrew, in the King James, it was called Jehovah Jireh, or uh, in our understanding, Yahweh Yira. God will provide. God is my provider. Now, maybe some point in your life, you've gone through that hard time where you've wondered, where is God in the midst of it? And now with hindsight, as you look back, you see that God provided you everything you needed to get out of the thicket or even to deal with life in the thicket with all of its pricklers, as hard as it may have been, God gave me what I needed. His grace was sufficient for today. Are you with me? You see, it's that understanding that says God has provided. It's not always the easy road out. It's not always cutting in, coming in with a machete to cut all the brambles around us out, but rather helping us to find our way out of the thicket and then helping to heal us as we move forward in our brokenness because God is with us in the midst of it. Now, God is an abundant God. God provides. 
God provides everything that we need, all the tools, like the fire, the knife, and the wood that was needed for this story. God provides us everything we need to make a difference in this world. But you see, if we sit here like this and say, hmm, I'm not certain I want to charge the field and participate in this game of God's mission. You see, then we're like a dam. We're like a dam that wants to hold the water back of the Holy Spirit and say, I'm going to just hold on to the Holy Spirit and God's abundance for myself. As soon as we do that, like a dam, the water inside of us becomes over time stagnant. It becomes stagnant and stale. It no longer is vibrant and life-giving. It's only when we allow the dam to be broken up and we open our hearts and our lives to God and to God's Holy Spirit, when we open our hearts and our lives to others and say, you know what, as I give, I know that I shall likewise receive. Now, I don't give because I'm looking forward to receiving. I give because I see an opportunity to give to others. Abraham was promised that he would be a blessing to all nations. God has said to us that we too will be a blessing to all nations, but that'll only happen if we give, amen? You see, it's generosity and abundance in our God. Our God has given us everything. We don't have to just rely on me and mine. And it isn't just ours to hoard. God is not a God of hoarding. And the people of God are not to be a God of hoarding, but a people of generosity and abundance. As you give, you will receive. As you give away to others your time and attention. As you give away your love to others. Heaven forbid we receive so much love back. How many times people have said, I went to the hospital to give some prayers and some love and some care to somebody else, but I came away from that hospital filled to overflowing because it seemed like they kept giving to me. That's a spiritual principle. So we don't apply it for what we receive. We give just because God wants to give us a spirit of generosity. And so too it is true of our witness in our life. God has placed us here to serve and love and care for others and share the name and the love and the claim of God upon all people so that others might come to see and know for themselves, God loves you. Jesus Christ is a life-giving source and he wants to give to you abundance and life and love and forgiveness and grace. He wants to restore hope to you. But how will people receive that unless we, like Abraham, are responsible and willing to give it away as well. So today I invite you to uncross your arms, to blow up the dam, to allow the Spirit of God to flow through you once again. And if it's been a while for the Spirit of God to flow through you, I want to say to you in that prayer of the Holy Spirit, stir up your Holy Spirit, strengthen me, encourage me, use me, God, as you would call me to do so. We will see over this summertime and in the years that follow that as we give, as we're abundant, as we allow our love of Christ to flow through us to others, as we serve in the name of Christ, as teachers, as plumbers, as electricians, as retired people who just volunteer our time, we're going to see how God blesses our community. There are so many who are so distant from God, who do not, many, do not even know that God has ever loved them, but how will they know unless you show them? And this is what it means to be a one body of Christ, but many members. One member cannot do it all. That's why we come together, friends, and I thank God for you. May our hearts be open today to God's Spirit. May we meditate on His Word. May we pray this Spirit prayer. And may God use us to share His abundance and His blessings to others. Amen.